Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, it's good to have everybody in and all of you joining us on television, wherever you are. My goodness, we get letters from here to Timbuktu and uh, some of them catch us in the middle of the night and some early in the morning, and some in the afternoon. So wherever you are, uh, we appreciate the fact that you welcome us into you, your home, your den, your living room or whatever. And uh, I think most of you realize we're just an informal Bible study. For those of you that are catching us for the first time, uh, we're not associated with any group. We are totally independent and uh, we have to just depend on the Lord. In fact, uh, someone offered to uh, help with fundraising and I said, no, I've got the greatest fundraiser a man could ever hope to have and that's the Lord himself. So uh, we don't beg for funds, we don't have anybody beating the bushes, and as the Lord provides, we'll keep reaching out. And uh, right now our, our audience is growing at a phenomenal rate, and uh, we just give the Lord the praise and the glory for it. Uh, again, we want to thank you for your letters and your help, and also if you call in with reference to the programs today, just let the girls know that you're interested in book number 49. Whether it's video, audio, or the print, doesn't make any difference. They're all the same number. 49. All right, we're going to go right back into Hebrews, and uh, I guess that's the only criticism I get. You spend too much time announcing. Well, I don't know how I can make it much shorter, but uh, we're going to get right into the book. Hebrews chapter 5, and now verse 7. Speaking of this priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now I'm not going to spend any more time on his Melchizedek priesthood because when we get to chapter 7 that whole chapter will be dealing with it and so I'm going to save a little for when we get there. Alright, but now moving on with regard to Christ being a priest after the order of Melchizedek, verse 7, who in the days of his flesh, in other words his earthly ministry, in his earthly ministry when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him who was able to save him from death. Boy, have you ever read that before? Carefully? What is it telling us? That here again, God the Son in his humanity, there in Jerusalem, after his three years of earthly ministry, and as he had gone down into that garden of Gethsemane, knowing that in a short period of time the Romans would be coming to make their formal arrest, and he, knowing exactly what was coming, you know, I always like to let people understand. Come back with me. Keep your hand in Hebrews. Now, most of you are aware this is the way I teach. When a verse comes to mind, I feel it's the unction of the Spirit. And we're going to go back and look at it. Luke 18. Luke 18. Because even though he was in the flesh, he suffered in the flesh. Yet he was gone. He knew the end from the beginning. Nothing, nothing took him by surprise. <clears throat> All right, in Luke 18, verses that we've looked at quite often in back a ways, starting at verse 31. Luke 18, verse 31. Now the setting is northern Israel, up there at the headwaters of the Jordan River, and it's just at the end of his three years of earthly ministry, they will soon be making their way up to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover and his crucifixion. All right, verse 31 of Luke 18. Then he took unto him the twelve, and he said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets, the Old Testament, all things concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished, for he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, the Romans, and he shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spit on, 
They shall scourge him, put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Did he know what was coming? Absolutely. Absolutely. Every detail. He knew every Roman that would be a part of it. He knew every Jewish voice that would be coming up against him. He knew it all. How much did the twelve know? I don't dare go without reading that. Next verse. And the twelve, verse 34, understood none of these things. And this, what he had just said, was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. See, that's how God can keep things from people's understanding. And so when you get to Jerusalem and all the hubbub of the Passover, did the twelve have any idea of what was about to happen? No. They had no idea he was going to die. They thought he was still ready to bring in the kingdom offered to Israel, see? But the Lord knew. All right, now then back to Hebrews. Maybe this will help just a little. And so during the days of his flesh, while he's there in Gethsemane, when he had sweat drops of blood, and he asked the twelve to pray with him, and instead of praying, what'd they do? Hey, they slept. And he woke them up, and he told them to pray with him. And he went a little further, and what'd the twelve do? They slept, see? But oh, he was going through the agony, knowing what was coming. All right, and so he did. He prayed and made supplication to God the Father from his humanity. Now, we always have to stop and realize, at the same token, he wouldn't have had to ask God to bring ten legions of angels. He could have commanded it himself. And he said it in so many words. If I wanted to be saved from this, God the Father would send those legions of angels. But, he never asked for that, see? And so in his supplications and strong crying and tears unto him who was able, which is God the Father, who was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Now the fear here is the beginning of wisdom. Godly fear is the beginning of wisdom. And so it wasn't that he was afraid of what was coming, but in his respect for all that was involved in his death. And he cries out to God the Father. In fact, you know what some of his prayer was. If it be possible, what? Let this cup be taken from me. What cup was he talking about? The cup of suffering. But it wasn't possible. It had to happen. And again, this is beyond my understanding and I think it is on any human, how that through all this suffering, God was able to save to the uttermost those who believe. Now, this is, this is just beyond us. But nevertheless, this was part and parcel of the suffering that he went through leading up to the cross. All right, let's go back to Philippians chapter 2. And we've used these verses so often, and I, I don't think there's any way I can wear them out. But come back with me to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8. My periodically, just in your own devotional time, read these verses. Philippians 2, beginning at verse 5. Philippians 2, starting at verse 5, where Paul writes, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now another verse comes to mind. I won't make you go back and find it, but Romans 12, verse 1. What does he say? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to be what? Huh? Living sacrifices, not conformed to this world. Well, this is all the same concept, see? That, you know, what I have to be so careful, and, and I just went through it again on one of my recent phone calls. 
When I explain salvation by faith and faith alone, by just simply believing that Christ died, was buried, and rose again, I have to immediately follow that up with, but this is not license. That now that you've made yourself fit for eternity, you don't have to worry about hell, you can go and live any way you want. No, that is not the way it works. And the first thing I try to impress on people, especially uh, older people that are up in their 40s and 50s and 60s, I say, now look, just because I'm maintaining you can be saved the moment you believe, remember that when you're saved, God's going to change you. God is going to change you. You're not going to be any longer the same person that you were. And the scripture makes it so plain that as soon as we believe, God makes us a new person with new appetites, new desires, and we're going to hate the things we once thought we had to have. And that's what people have to realize. That when we talk about a salvation by faith and faith alone, it's not a salvation that permits no change in lifestyle. There has to be a change in lifestyle or there's not a salvation. It's one or the other. All right, and so this is what Paul is admonishing here now back to Philippians chapter 2, that if we have the mind of Christ, it's not going to be that satanically driven process. It's going to be the opposite side of the coin. We're going to be driven now through the very thought processes of the one who loved us and gave himself for us. All right, now verse 6. Christ Jesus of verse 5, who being in the form, the visible manifestation of God, thought it not robbery, and if you have a margin, I think the best way is something that he could grasp at, to be equal with God. But instead, he made himself of no reputation, born in a manger, raised in a carpenter's shop, went through three years of earthly ministry with no place to lay his head. Don't let these television preachers convince you that he had wealth untold. Not in his earthly ministry he didn't. He said, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man hath no place to lay his head. That's exactly what it was. He had nothing of this world's goods. And so this is the reason. He made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant. Now that's a kind translation. What's a better word? Slave, bond slave. He took upon himself the form of a bond slave. How much rights did a bond slave have in antiquity? None, none. They were treated like dirt, cast aside at the moment's thought. All right, and so he took upon himself the form of a bond slave was made in the likeness of men. Now, you know, we're always trying to make that analogy. That in order for God to be the Savior of mankind, in order to be the high priest of the order of Melchizedek, what did he have to do? He had to become one of us. He had to. And he had to walk as men walked. He had to suffer the same passions of hunger and hurt and tiredness that we do in order to fully understand what it was to save mankind to the uttermost. See? All right, so made in the likeness of men so that he could become one of us and thereby not only become our great high priest, but also the Savior and the captain of our salvation. All right, now then verse 8, still in Philippians 2. Now being found in fashion as a what? A man. A man. He didn't look bizarre. He didn't look different. He looked very ordinary. He could walk through the crowd and strangers couldn't pick him out by his bizarre appearance. He was ordinary. He appeared as an ordinary man. All right? 
And so being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. How could he? Because he was God. He was God. He could do this to himself. He could take himself from the realms of glory, from the power of the creator. And he could bring himself down to be like mortal men. And so he humbled himself. And by becoming that, that epitome of humility, he became obedient unto death. Now, what does the word obedient imply? There was a requirement laid upon him. He had to die. There was no way out. Because without his death, humanity would have been totally destitute of salvation. Even the Old Testament believers would have been simply wiped out of all of it had he not died. Because you want to remember, even the Old Testament saints, the greatest of them, Moses, Abraham, you name them, without that finished work of the cross, their salvation wasn't complete either. See, and that's why when Christ went down into paradise and set those Old Testament captives free, why were they kept down there instead of going on to glory? Because their sins hadn't been atoned for. Animal blood didn't take away their sin. But it was when Christ's blood was shed that then the salvation of the Old Testament saint was complete. Their atonement was now complete and Christ could take them on up to glory, but not until. All right, but now back to our text. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto what? Death. And not just an ordinary death of maybe being killed with a sword or beheaded as Paul was, but something far worse, even the death of the cross. Now, you see, most of us just take that so glibly. And we say, oh, yeah, Christ died for me. But listen, that's not the half of it. We can never comprehend the suffering that he had to go through beyond, beyond the physical. A verse is coming to mind, I think it's 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's go back and look at it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Yeah, let's just jump in at verse 17. And I may have shared it before in the program. I know I have with my class in Oklahoma some time ago. I think it was probably back in the summertime. I read an account of a pastor in the Chicago area years ago. So I know he's long gone to glory. But he was a pastor of a large church in the Chicago area of over a thousand people. And one Sunday morning, he that's what made me think of it. He read this verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And I'm going to take the time to rehearse it because it shook me to my bootstraps and I think it should everybody. He read verse 17 of chapter 5 and he said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Goes right back to what I said three, four minutes ago. Old things are passed away. Our old desires, our old appetites, they have to go. Behold, all things are become new. Now that's what happens when we believe. All right, this pastor asked his huge congregation, including everyone in the balcony, if you are a Christian this morning, please stand. How many stood? Everybody. Not a one stayed seated. They all stood. He says, all right, please be seated. He read the verse again. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation and so forth. Now he said, if you know that you are in Christ and you are a new creation, please stand. How many stood? One here and there. Just one here and there. Precious few. Well, what does that tell you? 
That's typical. That's typical. That's why I've said it on this program. Others have said it. And the other night I shared it with one of my clients in Oklahoma, and lo and behold, somebody brought me a clipping out of a newspaper where some famous pastor had said almost the same thing. Our churches are full of unsaved church members. They're not in Christ. They haven't experienced a new life. They still got the old appetites. There's nothing different. And listen, that, that won't fit, see? All right, so now then reading on, uh, this isn't where I intended to come. I just happened to see the verse as I was turning to it. Reading on, he says in verse 18, All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, all the things that have set us apart from God have now been bringing us back to him. Verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. In other words, because when we become a believer, our sin debt is paid. And he hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. In other words, we're to tell a lost world, we're to tell lost friends, less co lost co-workers, hey, Christ has already reconciled you if you'll just believe it. Now verse 20, now then we're ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ that be ye reconciled to God by believing it. Now here's the verse I came back to read. Here's the one, I finally got there, verse 21. For he, God, hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us. Now don't read that too casually. What does that really mean? God laid all the sin of the world, including mine, including yours, on him. And here again, I can't comprehend that. And I don't think you can. But God laid all the sin of the world on Christ as he hung on that cross. See, that's what Philippians means, that he died even the death of the cross, knowing that the sins of the world would be laid on him. All right, reading on in this verse in Corinthians, he who became sin for us, he who knew no sin, he was perfect, he was sinless, and he went through the whole process that we, as lost, hell-bound sinners, might be made the righteousness of God in him. And this is what we have to believe. We take it by faith that when we believe that he died, was buried, and rose from the dead, then God imparts his righteousness unto us, and we're a new creation, and we're a new person. All right, back to Hebrews again. <clears throat> verse 8, still in chapter 5. Now verse 8. Though he were a son. Now again you have to remember how we stress that term son in the first two chapters of Hebrews. He was not just the carpenter's son. He was not just Mary's son. He was the very person of the Godhead that created everything. He was the one to whom the rest of the Godhead imparted all the responsibility of creation and of this work of the cross. And so though he were the Son, he was all-powerful, yet he learned what? Obedience to respond to the responsibility that had been given to him by the Godhead as a whole. All right, so yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. There in that agony leading up to and going through that death of the cross. All right, now verse 9. And being made Perfect, complete, I think is a better word. A complete Savior, a complete reconciler, one who forgives us to the uttermost, one who saves us to the uttermost. All right? And so he being made perfect, 
he became the author. Now back up a page or two. We, we covered almost the same identical word in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. Because I like to use all these scriptures because they all complement each other. Back in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. I got it, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain, same word, to make the captain of their salvation perfect or complete. But what did it take? Suffering. Suffering. Christ had to suffer in order to become then the captain of our salvation, or as it says here, now come back to chapter 5, verse 9, the author of our salvation. Without the suffering, it could have never happened. All right, so being made perfect, complete, he became, back in verse 9, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey. Well, what's another word for obeying? Believing. Believing. In fact, I just ran across a verse in Acts and I, I didn't remember ever stressing it in my teaching and it just hit me like a thunderbolt as I was teaching the other night. I think it was up in my Tahlequah class. Come back with me to Acts. I hope I can find it. I think it was in uh, chapter 13. Yeah. In Acts chapter 13, my, a verse that I've missed all these years. Acts chapter 13. Same chapter where we were a little bit ago about the only begotten Son of God. All right, verse 35, let's just read on. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thy holy one to see corruption, Verse 36, for David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep, he died, and was laid unto his fathers, and he saw corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, Jesus the Christ, is preached forgiveness of sins. Now look at verse 39. And by him all that, what? Believe. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Felding Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.